Hey everybody, this is Josh McKinney, and I just want to welcome you to episode 119 of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. I'm not going to waste your guys' time on this one. I'm not going to give you a long intro. Uh, I'm going to give you a short one. And I just wanted to kind of preface with this. I will argue that this is the most powerful episode of the show that we've ever put out. Um, I, I get to interview my friend Cody Kellison. His story is, uh, it's a it's a really good story and it's a really powerful story and I'll just leave it at that. Um, but I wanted to give you guys a challenge and then just jump right into the episode. So we do talk quite a bit of mental health on this story and um, of course we talk jujitsu and how it can tie in and how friendship especially uh, can be important for mental health. And um, so what I wanted to do is give you guys a challenge. And the challenge is this. If there is somebody at your gym that you think about during this episode, uh, especially somebody who doesn't train anymore or doesn't train as much anymore, send them this. It doesn't have to be because you think they struggle with mental health or something like that. It simply means that you miss them. Send them this challenge, them to listen to it for an hour and Hopefully, hopefully Cody's story can bring him back to the gym and uh, hopefully that message can let that person know um, the fact that you sent this episode could let that person know uh, that you care about them and that there are people at the gym that care about them and there are people that care about them. Uh, and that's what I'll leave you guys with. Let's just go ahead and jump right into the episode. Cody, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing pretty good, brother. How about yourself? I am doing well. Just left uh, getting some training in. It was really nice. Uh, what is your what are you what's your body feeling like? You just got done competing. You competed yesterday, right? Uh, I competed Saturday. Yesterday, Saturday. yesterday was a travel home day for me. Um, I learned uh, this weekend to never travel cheap airlines. What though, airline did you did you travel? I flew Allegiant. And okay. uh, the first day up there, um, it got pushed back eight hours. Okay. That's some that, of, that's some, rough. Yeah. Some of which due to weather, some of which due to just plain incompetence. And then on the way back yesterday, it got also got pushed back a couple hours. So Man. I was just like, I'm going, I'm going to splurge the extra money anyways. And then at the end of the day, when you fly like those cheap airlines, they nickel and bag you for your bags anyways. Mm -hmm. So you really don't end up saving that much money for the hassle anyway so you really don't what uh did you leave out of like belleville yes that's exactly where i went yeah yeah <laughs> man and see the tough thing about that is you go in and they're like how yeah, we got uh, a problem with this airplane and it's the only freaking airplane that we have right. <laughs> you know it's the same one we've been using the last 40 years and it is the only one that we got so hey guys uh we got <laughs> engine failure today so, yeah, uh, we'll get off the ground here in like 30 <laughs> minutes. And you're like, what? <laughs> Dude, they uh, one time I was at I was it was post worlds. I want to say 16, 17. I was at a, a tournament. I was I was coming home and I flying by myself and I was at LAX for 14 hours because oh, they thanks. kept pushing us back and kept pushing us back. And finally, we're, we're seven hours into waiting for the flight. And the lady goes, uh, bring like says something on the speaker, and then she says off the speaker, "Can everybody please come close to me?" And everybody walked up that was still waiting for the flight, and she goes, "I really don't think that your flight is ever going to take off." She goes, "I know I just pushed it back two hours." She goes, "But it's not taking off. Uh, here's a number. Call it. Go find other flights." <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, sweet. And so then I was there seven more hours waiting for the flight, the next flight to take off. Yeah, just a whole extra day hanging out it, in the airport. You it know? was, yeah, exactly how I wanted to spend the day. <laughs> buy, <laughs> buying $20 McNuggets to eat. <laughs> so you got a ton of competition in last year. Yes. What is kind of, uh, how, how many, how, do you know how many, how many tournaments you did last year? Uh, off the top of my head, I did four or five, eight tournaments, I believe is the, is around eight or seven or eight. How many super fights? Uh, just one, actually. I just had the one with Devin and that was it. That, everything that else was, was tournaments. A good one. A, a year off of that one too. Yeah. A year today. A, a year, year today, today. That was your first black belt match, correct? Yes. 
what have you learned as a black belt? What have you noticed competitively, especially what have you noticed differently as a black belt in competition? Um, I think the, uh, the most prominent thing I've noticed is just the pressure that black Uh belts are able to keep throughout the whole match. Um, whenever, uh, I was competing like Brown, purple, blue, um, like guys would have good pressure in only certain areas. So, a guy would have good pressure from like top half guard or mount, whatever, but other, everything else, the pressure wouldn't be there. Black belts, especially ones that compete all the time. And I've had a, a lot of my uh, first matches the last year at tournaments were already world champions. Mm-hmm. So their pressure, just the entire match is just crazy. It's just like, you feel like you have no space. It's very constricting. And even through like, like even on standup, um, like when my match with the brow Morum at Nogi worlds, he was just suffocating me with space the whole time. Like he was just always in my face, not giving me anything. And he's always looking for stuff. And it's just things like little things like that, that people don't really think about when they're lower belts. Um, it's just the, the amount of space they take away while still being able to attack you is just mind blowing. How have you adjusted your training for that? Um, I try to do that to other people. Yeah. Like, like obviously I start with like the lower belts when I was working on stuff like that. I do that to other people and I try to really make uh, my openings in a match, my a game stuff. So like, whereas like I was Brown belt, um, I would just let the match kind of come to me. I would just like pull my, my goal was pull guard, not pull lasso or pull close guard, but just pull guard. And I would let the guys come to me and I would take advantage of that. Now, I'm much more, I need to pull directly into something. I need to pull directly into attacking something so I can get them on the back foot. And I can do that same thing that those guys were doing to me last year. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. So you're, you, you got to compete for the first time this year, right? So this is your, I guess now we're at your second year as a black belt. How yeah. did, how was your experience? Did you notice that you were more prepped for uh, the intensity of the level this time doing Miami? Uh, 100%. For one, I went into the match more confident. Um, I don't think I knew that at the time, but like looking back on like uh, uh, looking back on the footage and everything I took, I can definitely see that. But also I was attacking a lot more as where last year I was kind of sitting back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's like new black belt rookie nerves that were taken over last year, or I just am more confident in my technique now, but I was more, on the gas pedal, attacking the guy, and I found myself in, you know, a lot more advantageous positions than I did last year. So what do you think when you are, um, you know, so like this this year, uh, you and I, I think we probably became better friends because we dealt with the same thing yeah. of <laughs> every fight. We were competed at every tournament, and we fought world champions in every match. Every single uh, match, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a really bizarre year. Um, what are some other takeaways for you that you like looking out at your 2021 season? Um, what are some other things you've taken away that you've said, Hey, I should tweak this for 22. Um, I think, uh, physically, I think the biggest thing was like my grip strength, uh, because as you know, like competition, black belts are strong as fuck. Mm -hmm. So like, if you don't have a good grip strength, they're going to pull out of literally everything. Yeah. And it's not like. It's not like there's some secret technique they're doing. They just, you know, they're used to the grip, the grip strength of other people all the time. And they just rip out of stuff and they're just strong. And they've been usually most of them been doing it since they were little kids. So they already have that kind of built in. So I went, um, I've done a lot of work on my grip strength, a lot of uh, work on my forearm strength and things like that. Um, I think that's helped a lot because I just keep guys where I want them. Other than that, I mean, I just, I put a lot of pressure on myself as a first year black belt um, that I shouldn't have. So yeah. like, I, uh, you see guys like, like Andrew, uh, Wilty, for instance, or like a Roberto Jimenez, those guys who came out their first year at black belt and they just killed everybody. You know, those are exceptions to the rule and not the rule. Yes. And I think, uh, I think going as a rookie black belt and putting all that pressure on yourself where like, you know, I had a pretty good Brown belt career. So I think I thought I was going to go right into black belt with that same success. And I think that was, a what every, every competitor is going to think that. But at the same time, you got to realize that, you know, you're going to lose a lot more than you did at black belt and that's okay. And you know, that, that helps you learn and that helps you become a better competitor and a better martial artist in general. 
And I think going into this year, you know, towards the end of last year, going into this year, I just kind of took that pressure off myself. So now I'm going out there and like, I'm not really, I'm, I like winning, you know, I'm trying to win, but I'm not really setting my whole experience on if I lose or if I, if I just get third or second place, then this is a horrible experience for me. You know, it's just more, I don't know. It's more freeing thinking like that to me than it is like, Oh, I have to win. I have to win. I have to win. You know, things like that. It, it's so interesting how much just a perspective change can make you a better competitor. It is. It hundred percent is. Just wanted to interrupt really quick to tell you guys about two exciting things that we have going on at simplifying jujitsu.com. First up the simplifying jujitsu ebook, the free ebook. These are the last few weeks to get it. I don't have an exact release date on when the new instructional comes out about jujitsu method. Uh, it's called the three lenses. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but it's going to come out within the next month. And uh, when it does, the Simplifying Jujitsu ebook is going to be taken off the shelf. It'll probably be revised. Um, there are just that, you know, I wrote that ebook three years ago. There, there are just certain things uh, that I know better now or no more efficiently now and so that ebook will be revised uh, so the last chance to get the original copy is this month um, on april 1st i am taking that copy off whether or not um, we are done with the three lenses and it's ready to release but regardless of that uh, the simplifying jujitsu ebook this is the last chance to get it and it is also this entire month the last chance to get the discounted rate of the Simplifying Takedowns instructional from Kyle Watson, who's gonna be on the podcast next week. Kyle is uh, my coach. He's been my coach since I started Jiu Jitsu. And I uh, tell people he is one of the best coaches in Jiu Jitsu that you'll ever see. So good at getting you to do things. He's so good at convincing you to get good at things. And that's really what he does in this instructional. He makes the takedowns so much easier than you've ever seen anyone explain them. And it makes you want to go train takedowns because they stop being this thing that, that feel like this black hole of jujitsu and they start to feel like something that not only do you have knowledge of, but a lot more knowledge than almost anyone else does on the feet because people are afraid to train it. So if you go to simplifyingjujitsu.com slash takedowns and use promo code Watson, you will get $50 off simplifying takedowns. Remember, this is only at simplifyingjujitsu.com slash takedown. I'll see you guys there. What were some things that you have, what's kind of been your self-talk to get out of that headspace of, because I think that everybody who's competed a bit, especially anyone who's had any level of success, really understands the pressure that we put on ourselves. Uh, it's, you know, and usually it's not helpful. Uh, usually it is, you know, obsessive mental loops and things like that. And uh, it, it's not helpful for us. What is your, what was like, comparing your self-talk to this tournament from the last times you competed, maybe where you didn't feel as comfortable? Uh, I think um, the biggest thing is I, I just, I just wasn't uh, so sure I was going to win. You know what I mean? So like, it wasn't like, like when I went in um, like the match with Devin is a good example. Uh, the, New Orleans open and the Miami open last year are another good example. It's like I went in and I knew the guys were good, but I was like, man, fuck these guys. I'm way better. You know what I mean? And so when I lost, it just made it that much worse. And then the self doubt starts creeping in more and more and more as you think like that and you start losing more. And so that really, that, that's something I was dealing with all last year. And then I, I started getting a little bit of a imposter syndrome as a black belt for a little mm -hmm. bit. And that I had to like break myself out of that too. So this time when I went and competed, it's like I, I'm coming off a knee injury too. So like I hurt myself before Master Worlds last year, as I had to take a, some time off. And so this is my first tournament after that. So I kind of told myself I was like, "Hey, this is my first tournament after an injury. I've been out a while. Uh, you know, I didn't really do that great last year. Um, let's just go out there. Let's just you know throw some some spaghetti at the fridge, see what sticks. Have some, have a good time. Enjoy the day of doing jujitsu for a living." And just see what happens. And like, I think that mentality just kind of helped me get through everything. Also, like, 
I train with really, really good guys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, in my humble opinion, Andrew Wiltsey is probably the best black belt in the world, especially in the training room. So I'm like that. These guys aren't going to do anything that Andrew doesn't do to me all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> that Andrew so I, doesn't do ten times faster to me. You yeah, know? <laughs> right. If I can grab them, I'm doing better. So like, just thinking like that just kind of helps me out. And also, like, I have this weird thing to where like, uh, I'm sure everybody does. It. Like, everybody thinks like, oh, this guy I'm fighting is probably way better than me. Uh, so like, I'll do that. I'll have that thought go through my mind right before I'm about to fight. But if I start, if I look at the mat like the competition mats and I'm watching everybody else do jujitsu. It's all jujitsu, man. It's all the same yeah. stuff everybody's doing. Nobody's got any secret techniques anymore. So that also calms me down a little bit too. Like just sitting there and like, just like looking and like having a logical thought, like, Hey, you know, it's going to be like, you have six minutes, you're either going to win or you're going to lose. Nothing changes. Who cares? You know what I mean? So yeah, the, that kind of that helps me out. Basically too, not getting, not trying to get your identity as, well, I'm the gold medalist at the Miami open, right? Like yeah. that is yeah. <laughs> a lot of people that's like, you know, you focus so much on it. You think of yourself as the pan champion or the world champion yes. so much that if you don't get it, then you go, I, I suck. I, I, you know, I, whatever, you know, but most, you know what, out of, if a hundred people are in your division, 99 of them are going to lose. Not yeah, all 99 right. suck. <laughs> yeah. You know? right. Most of them are probably pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then like, here's another thing too. Like I always say, like, I say this to uh, like our new guys that compete at like Fuji's and stuff, but it also applies to like the big, like, like a lot of the, the black belts that compete. What changes in your life if you win or lose? <laughs> nothing nothing yeah. changes zero you know if you win adcc that's different obviously mm -hmm. um, but it's even getting to the point now like if you win adult worlds like your life's not going to change dramatic dramatically you know no. what i mean it, it's just going like you're going to get like a couple more high fives and you'll probably get some free geese in the mail and like that's it <laughs> like you know what Dude. i mean like your life isn't going to change that much and it's, the same goes for losing like your students don't care your friends don't care you know, like they're excited when you, when you win for but they're excited for you. You know, they're not excited that you won something. They're excited that you had success in what you're trying to do. And if you lose it, nothing changes. Their, their opinion of you doesn't, doesn't it, change at all. A perfect example is because you, you just brought up Wiltsy. Yeah. Uh, I guess it would have been maybe a year, 18 months ago, maybe sometime in that area. Uh, Andrew and I competed against each other. And yeah. um, I was having this conversation recently with one of my blue belts and he was really discouraged with how he performed at the last tournament. And I could just tell he was putting so much pressure on himself. And he, you know, he's like, I just feel like I disappointed you guys. I feel like I, I'm like, dude, we don't care. And you just wouldn't believe it. And I go, okay, I want you to think back. I go, remember your new white belt, you buy tickets to see your coach compete in the main event. And I lose. I go, did you say, oh my gosh, I hate Josh. I'm disappointed in Josh. I'm whatever. And he goes, no. I go, you probably said something like, man, I, I really wanted Josh to win so bad so Josh could get the victory. You know, I go, yeah. it's the same thing with us. We just want you to win for you. You know, if I'm coaching Cody Kellison, it's because I want Cody to win for Cody. I don't really care if he wins. You know, it doesn't change my life, but. I want him to win for him, you know, and if he doesn't, then we're here for him. And I think that most people don't realize that's how most gyms are. It's like, no one really cares that you lost, man. Yeah. No, no one, no one really gives a shit. Like how many open titles you have or how many Fuji state titles you have. And like, that's another big thing, like for, especially for like new white belts, like their first tournament, um, like friends, I had a guy who, you know, he'd started like training like three months ago. And he was like, hey, I want to do the state tournament. I was like, all right, cool, dude. He goes, what should I expect? I was like, you're going to get nervous. Or you're going to do something stupid. <laughs> but you, you might win. You might lose. I was like, but it doesn't matter. He was like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, I was like, I was like, do you know what happens if you lose? He goes, what? And I was like, nothing. I was like, you know what happens if you win? He goes, what? And I go, nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, that's it. You're going to have a medal in your closet that you had that one time. And that's it. And like, I think if more, if more competitors thought that way, then not only would their life probably be easier, but you would have less, I don't know, like crazy ego checks that you would have, you know, mm -hmm. you've seen people like at like a random tournament, get mad when they lose. And it'd, it'd be like a, a super known black belt who just made an ass of himself on the mat. Cause he freaked out and like punched the mat that he lost, you know, like an hour later, that dude's probably feeling like an idiot, 
Mm -hmm. if, more, if more people thought like that, thought like logically, like, hey, it doesn't really matter, then I think you'd get less of those things like that. Yeah, I I think that's dead on, man. I really do. I it, it's it is. Um, I think people would compete much better too. You know, if they didn't go in putting so not that they didn't care. You know, not that losing didn't matter. You don't want to lose, but it's not the end of the world. You know, you it's lose, even, just go to the next one. Yeah, it's not even the end of a good day. Like, it, really, I mean, it really like is. Thirty minutes later, it's not even on your mind anymore. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And, and that's, what, uh, that's what people seem to forget. That's really good. Uh, Me included. <laughs> but I, I want to get back to competition mindset, things like that. But before we do, uh, I do want to ask, because I actually don't know this. Um, usually I do know this on the episode before I ask people. But what got you started in jujitsu? Uh, this, this is a long one. So we got some time. We've got as much time as you need, man. Awesome. So I started, um, so my uncle, uh, who's actually a purple belt, um, and he's one of my judo coaches, he got me started, like, wrestling around. He did some, like, submission grappling, like, a long time ago and, like, when he was living in D.C. and stuff. So he got me, like, started on, like, the martial arts slash grappling training when I was, like, 10 years old. And then when I was 14, I started doing judo. And I did judo for a long time. And then I got, I was like, oh, I'm going to be an MMA fighter. Like everybody does back in the day. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so when I was like 17 years old, I, uh, I started, I did like four MMA fights while I was still in high school. <laughs> luckily yeah. I didn't fight. Luckily I fought guys who trained out of their garage. So I won just off like my uncle's limited kickboxing experience and my judo experience. Um, Were you the that, co coolest guy in high school? No, I actually wasn't. People really didn't believe me. Like, oh, no. <laughs> like, people didn't believe. Like, I got into a couple fights in high school that where people started like seeing it. Like, I had like this wrestler guy pick a fight with me because like his girlfriend at the time liked me, and he double legged me, and I triangled him and put him to sleep. <laughs> and so after that, people were kind of like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> like, because this was back in like 2005 to 2007, where like people still thought UFC was kind of fake. <laughs> so they, they thought that like, I was like, I was out there like doing like pro wrestling. Yeah. And it's so, all the same. Yeah. yeah nothing different. Uh, but no people, people that just thought I was lying and up until like my senior year and they're like, Oh, he's actually doing that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> but then um, right around the end of my senior year, uh, I had uh, my mom was with this dude and we were living at his house and me and him got into it constantly. And I just, you know, I just up and left and was like homeless for like three months. And uh, so I stopped training all the time, stopped doing that. And I started working as a DJ, which kind of took me away from a martial artist lifestyle into I'm um, partying seven days a week lifestyle. And I did that for a long time, even when, so like 2014 uh, or 2013, Brian Imholz, who's my current still my coach opened up his gym down here and i was doing jujitsu as like a hobby you know what i mean like i had uh i was still doing judo every now and then i started doing jujitsu um like i was training every day but i wasn't taking training seriously you know what i mean like it was still like i would come in at noon class hungover because i was djing the night before or i'd show up at like 4 a.m class stri like straight from the bar things like that and i did that for a long time and then like just people that do that lifestyle aren't mentally stable so i was like 26 27 doing i've been djing since i was 18 and like the lifestyle is starting to wear on me i started realizing like none of my friends were real friends mm -hmm. um the people i'm hanging around with all the time like they're only hanging out with me because i partied and they party they weren't they weren't looking out for my best interest things like that um i had a bunch of personal stuff going on and i got severely depressed and my best friend had just moved down to florida and me and him had been talking about him living in Florida. And he's like, man, it's so great. You know, blah, blah, this, that. And I had like a, just a real, just like a real rough couple of weeks, man. And like, I was sitting at home, I was drinking and I, you know, I was like, you know, fuck it. None of this is worth it anymore. And I fucking tried to kill myself in my closet and the rack broke. And I kind of had like a epiphany at that point. I was like, oh shit, that was you know, that was serious. 
and everything started like started seeing things clear. And I just called my best friend who was in Florida. I called him crying. I was like, I told him what happened. I was like, Hey man, I'm just not doing good. He was like, dude, he was like, just pack everything and move down to Florida. <laughs> he's like, he's like, get away from that situation. He goes, he goes, just, just take yourself out of that lifestyle, force yourself out of it and force yourself to do something else. And so like a month later, I packed everything up. I said, like, that's a good idea. And I moved down to Fort Myers. And so while I was in Fort Myers, I actually wasn't like, like the jujitsu, like I was a blue belt at the time, the jujitsu thing, like really wasn't in the forefront of my mind, but like I had some free time because in Florida, the, uh, um, this, I moved down there in the summer. So Florida goes through like seasons. So in the summer, it's like, it's pretty, pretty dead. There's not a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of free time and I had a lot of alone time for like a lot of like, like uh, reflection and things like that. And I got like, just over the span of like two months, I just got way happier. You know, I wasn't around a bunch of toxic people. I wasn't drinking to cope with things anymore. Uh, you know, I was around my best friend all the time and, you know, things just started looking up and I just started realizing, I was like, man, I could have, you know, I could have had this back home, but I was just, you know, blinded by everything to see it. And so I started doing jujitsu down there because it was the only activity I could afford. I was like, I can afford one activity. I'm going to do jujitsu, mm -hmm. you know? So I started, I went to like kind of a smaller gym. It was a Gracie Humida Southwest Florida. Uh, I went there because they were already a team that I was on team back home and the guys accepted me and I just beca it became part of that family instead of where at home I was part of, you know, the, the party guy, like I was hanging out with parties all the time. And it just, the whole community just welcomed me in and like made me did numerous things for my mental health that were great. Um, I started doing more competitions, more competitions, more competitions. And it just hit me one day. I was like, dude, this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is what I want to do full time. And so I started making moves to do that in Florida. So I was teaching like a judo class because I had got my, I was a black belt in judo. I started doing that, started being, you know, just in the community more, doing more competitions. And then one day I was talking to Brian, Brian Einhold my coach in Missouri. And I was just like, man, I was like, I was like, I, I, he's like, I should have, I was like, I should have been like this when I was back home. I was like, I can't believe I let, you know, three years of training down there be squandered. I should have took this seriously then. And uh, he was like, he was also upset that he had, he had some help at the gym, but they weren't really helping. Like they weren't really doing their duties. And he, he called me one day. He's like, Hey man, he goes, how seriously do you want to do jujitsu for a living? And I said, more than anything, man. I was like, that's what I want to do. I was like, I want to teach. I want to be world champion. You know, I just want to, I want this to be my life. And he goes, can you be here next week? And can you do everything I say without asking? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. And so I packed, I packed my shit up, drove the 17 hour way in one shot. And I got there and he goes, look, man, he goes, we can do this. He goes, but you got to do what I say. He goes, you're also got to realize you're not going to get paid shit for a while. <laughs> Cause we're still a growing gym. And I was like, whatever, dude, I don't care. And luckily, um, like the, the, the fewer, like three or four good friends I had in Cape, I still kept in contact with and uh, one of them let me move into his house for free. Um, he just said, man, take care of the yard work, take care of stuff around the house. And, it, you know, we don't need the money. He's like, just, you know, get your life set up. And it all went from there, man. From there, Brian took me under his wings, taught me how to like teach at the gym, taught me how to be a good instructor, taught me how to compete. And then, you know, flash forward and five years later and here I am like doing mm -hmm. anything. Wild. <laughs> that is a very wild story. There's a yeah. lot to unpack, a lot yeah. of questions that I had. So uh, let's start here. You talked, you said you felt a, you had an epiphany after a, a suicide attempt. Yeah. What do you, do you remember what that epiphany sounded like? Do you remember what that, what that was? hundred percent. So it happened immediately after. So like I tried, I took a, uh, a belt and tried to hang myself from like the closet rack where you hang your clothes and that broke. And so after it broke, I was just kind of sitting there and it, like, I was like thinking about what I'd like literally irrationally tried. Mm -hmm. I was like, Holy shit. I just did that. And I was like, I'm glad that thing broke or else I wouldn't be here right now. And then I was like, man, that was fucking stupid. And then I just started going through, I was like, man, you can change this. You just got to change it. You know, like, like thankfully, like a clear headed me started thinking about it and it was, you know, 
one revelation after another. Like, you know, I've been doing this to myself. I've been hanging around with a bunch of fake ass friends, um, been chasing after the wrong girls, you know, looking for the wrong things in life. And then I was just like, and it just hit me of how much of a, uh, an idiot was. And I'm not saying that like anybody that, you know, attempts suicide is an idiot. I'm saying I was at that moment. And I was like, man, that was dumb, man. You gotta, you gotta, I was like, I have a son, you know, I got a family that loves me. You know, I still have some good friends despite being surrounded by a bunch of bad ones. And I just started breaking down. And that's like, you know, the only person I can call was my best friend, Jeff. And he's the one that kind of like, was like, yo, dude, just come down here. He's like, he's like, get away from it all. He's like, you know, you're not going to be able to see everything for what it is unless you're away from it all for a while. And that's <laughs> kind of where everything took off. Hey, your best yeah. friend Jeff sounds like a good yeah. dude. He is. He is a good dude, man. I, and, and moving to Florida, even though I wasn't there for like really that long of a time, moving to Florida really was the best thing I've ever done in my life because it allowed me to, you know, see things from an outside perspective, you know, see not, not being in a bar seven days a week around a bunch of people who are probably going through the same stuff. I am not being surrounded by, uh, you know, the flashiness of what people will like a lot of young people think that like partying all the time is great and it's fun in the moment, but like, you know, every morning you wake up thinking like, you know, what the fuck am I doing? You know, where's the, where's the end of the road? And then honestly, like DJing, there's a time I was DJing and I, I looked around. I thought was like, I was like 25, 26. I looked around. I was like, man, I'm the oldest person here. <laughs> like, <laughs> what the fuck am I doing? You know what I mean? And I think people that are stuck in those like kind of like loops, those life loops, uh -huh. they need a revelation like that. And, you know, it's going to be different for everybody. But once they see it, you know, things can go two ways. Um, they can see it and do something about it, or they can see it. And like what I did was I didn't do anything about it. And it just made me mentally worse. And it made me mentally not enjoy what was going on, but I was still doing it. And it just made things worse, worse and worse until somebody intervened and was like, Hey, here's a solution. And thankfully I took that solution up and I made it happen. If somebody who is listening right now was dealing with something similar, some type of similar uh, a thought process, or um, just a similar life loop, what would be advice you would give them, if, if any? Uh, I would say, you know, do the same, like do similar to what I did, whereas I, I took my longest friend, the guy I was close to most in the world, and I just opened up to him. Um, you know, I told him everything that was going on. And, you know, if you have someone like that in your life, they are, you know, they're going to tell you what they think is best for you because they want what's best for you. If you don't have that, unfortunately, you're going to have to, you know, seek professional help, uh, professional yeah. therapy, things like that, which I'm a big advocate of. I don't do it personally because I'm poor, but <laughs> I'm a big, I am a big advocate of it. I know, you know, friends, family that all have done professional help and has helped them wonders. So those two things, you know, open up to somebody that cares. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't open up to the people that are giving you problems and expect them to fix the problems. You know what I mean? That, so that you got it. Yeah, I do know. Yeah, you got it. You got to go. You got to go to the people that know you the best and people that care for you the most and, and open up that way and hope that, you know, that helps. That is I think that's really, really good advice, Cody. Uh, I so so you you get let's say when you go to Florida, what does jujitsu kind of look like for you? You say you have you know just enough money for this one activity. What does what's training look like? What is the new Cody starting to look like. So I went to, so there was initially where it was a gym uh, across the street from where I lived. Um, and I went in there and I went, I went to, I had saved some money before I moved down there. So I was like, Hey man, I got enough to pay for the year up front. Cause I didn't know what I was going to do for a job. I didn't know anything. So I was like, I got enough money to pay for a year up front and then I can worry about everything else. So I went in there. And class would be run by a purple belt. And he's like, yeah, the owner's not here. You can't sign up yet. He's like, you can just, you know, do class. It's cool. And I was like, all right, cool. So I trained there for about four days to a week. And then the guy never came in. And one day I was, uh, we were out getting pizza. And I saw a guy with a Gracie Midas shirt on. And I asked him, I was like, hey, man, are you from here? Or are you visiting? And he said, I'm from here. Wow. I was like, I was like, do you train at a Gracie Humida school? And he's like, yeah, there's one in Cape Coral, which is like 30 minutes away from where I was. And I was like, I asked him for the address. I said, hey, man, I'm a blue belt. Uh, my coach is from Gracie Humida. I'd like to 
you know, visit your guys' gym. So I went there. I walked in. There was seven Brazilians on the mat. No, no, no Americans. <laughs> uh, two guys spoke English. And I told them, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm a blue belt. Um, you know, uh, Brian Imholz is my coach. J.W. Wright is his coach. Of course, they didn't know who they were. And then they, they kind of like were skeptical about me being a blue belt. So I showed them a picture of Hoyler tying the blue belt around me. They're like, okay. <laughs> and so we did class. Okay, this guy checks out. <laughs> yeah. So we did class. Uh, everything was taught in Portuguese. You know, I kind of made it through. And then we were rolling. And I rolled with this dude. His name is Afonso Alves. He's a, he was a third degree at the time. I think he might be fifth now. Um, and he, uh, he did that kind of like ghost arm bar with just the hips. Uh -huh. right? He did that to me about a thousand times in five minutes. Every time I touched him, it happened. And I was like, huh, okay. These guys are pretty good. And I just needed to get my ass beat all over the map by like these seven Brazilian black belts over there. And, uh, I started training a lot with my coach down there, Fabio Franco da Silva and this Afonso guy, like all the other Brazilians were kind of in and out. They weren't like, they all had jobs or they all were visiting from Brazil, things like that. And so when me and Afonso would train, he would just beat my ass and he didn't speak any English and he would just kind of point it. He would stop and point at things to help me out. And uh, this is where like what I still use now with my leg lasso. So I'm flexible. So they would like kind of pass my guard easily and the only thing I would have is I would throw that leg into the arm. And that's how I started to develop my lasso guard. And that's all I did for about a year. And uh, it just started doing that. And um, I would do that to other people. I would have to work my things like passing or anything else on like the lower belts at the time. And I just started, you know, doing that old, uh, what people talk about. Now they heard Joe Rogan talk about it. If you want to get good, roll with a lot of blue belts. So I would mm -hmm. roll with, I would roll with Afonso every Saturday for about four hours. And then during the week, everything he pointed at that I was fucking up, I would do to blue belts. And then Fabio, who has, he's got a really good half guard and a really good top game. He would help me with that, with that stuff when we rolled too. And everything just started coming together. And then I decided I wanted to do some tournaments and I started uh, just submitting everybody at blue belt. It was just, you know, my judo background, was was pretty helpful i would go take guys down and i'd be on top and go to side control and i did that take the lapel over the neck choke uh -huh. you know what i mean yeah i, I know that. exactly what you're talking I, about i did that to everybody for a year like that was the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> but like what people didn't know was like how good my guard was from rolling with afonso and fabio so much i would just throw my my leg into the arm because that's the only thing i could get my foot on and that's how i developed the lasso game and everything just kind of grew from there. And it's, you know, I started uh, making my work schedule around training times. Um, I told my, my boss, so I was a kayak tour guide. Um, I told my boss, I was like, Hey, I need to be off at this time every night so I can train. Uh, I can't work on the weekends. And he was like, cool, no worries. And, you know, I just started training essentially full time at that time. Um, what would be like full time for like a hobbyist. I started mm -hmm. doing that more and more. And I, the more and more I did that, the more and more I wanted to do more and the more and more I hated doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> every time I was at work, I was thinking about how I would rather be doing jujitsu and like everybody else is getting better. And I'm, I'm not getting better sitting here showing people uh, where to kayak. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, right, be before we move on, just uh, do you still uh, battle with depression? Um, not as bad. Uh, I have a, uh, you know, being somebody that was that close to having my life over, I kind of see things differently now to where I, you know, like things really aren't that big a deal to me anymore. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm a human, you know, I do get sad about things. Uh, you know, it's not, but it's not all the time. I'm not all the time sad. If I get sad, I'm, you know, I'm sad for like a day or two. And then I'll, you know, I kind of talk myself out of it. I'm like, Hey, it's not that bad, you know, or like a lot of people know you go train. And then once you go train, you like, you know, your endorphins kick in and you be, you dopamine drops and you get in a way better mood. Mm -hmm. And that kind of helps you see things uh, more clearly. And, you know, you realize like, Hey, the situation you're in isn't that fucking bad. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I got a, I got, you know, three kids that love me. I got a girlfriend who loves me. I got a great team. 
you know, like who gives a shit, you know, about this one little thing I'm sad about. It's, you know, it's, it's minor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like some things, you know, my, my grandma died. That was pretty hard on me. But even the the day my grandma died, I went to PSF Mm -hmm. and they knew what was going on. And, you know, those guys helped me through it. And by the end of the day, like I was sad, but like, I wasn't upset if that makes sense. That makes Um, sense. Yeah. So, uh, not, not really depression. Um, I get the imposter syndrome still, still kicks in every once in a while. Like, um, I'll be teaching a seminar or something, or I'll be, te- I'll, I'll have like a, uh, or actually when I won pans at Brown belt, I was like, damn, I got lucky. I don't deserve to win this. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, you're looking around and you're going, man, all these other divisions around me were tough. My division must have just sucked. I was like, I, don't know. I was like, man, I was like, I was like, fuck dude. I was like, I don't think I'm that good. Like how the fuck did this? I, was, I just got so lucky. And then I, I was actually, you know, who got me out of that was a uh, bird, Andrew's little brother. Uh, I was talking to bird about it and he was like, nah, fuck that man. You earned that. He goes, you're a pan champion. He goes, yeah. even if you, even if you did get lucky, no one can take that away from you. That's you now. I was like, fuck bird. You're right. Thanks dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, yeah, I mean like everybody I get, you know, upset about things or I, I, I get uh, in the dumps quote unquote, but you know, just, you know, being, having a life that, you know, I'm lucky to live. It, it doesn't last long. How was the adjustment moving back to uh, get to train and um, at Cape Girardeau? Uh, jiu-jitsu wise, easy. You know what I mean? Because every I, I knew everybody, and when I would come back to visit, I would train. There. Um, social life was a little hard because everybody still want everybody still thought of me as like, you know, DJ DJ Code Red DJ Cody Kellison. You know, they still thought of me as that. So I, I DJed a little bit because I, I was making like 600 bucks a month from the gym. Like you can't live off that. You know what I mean? So I was DJing a little bit in my free time, uh, but it just wasn't the same. Like uh, everybody expected me to, you know, be fucking like the crazy guy I was before where I was just going wild and having crazy parties all the time. And I wasn't that person anymore. And so like a lot of my quote unquote friends that I had before I moved kind of fell off the wayside then. And like, luckily I still had like, uh, like four or five that would just come hang out while I was DJing. We'd have a good time. Um, you know, we wouldn't get too wild. Like a lot of times I wouldn't even like have a drink when I was DJing because like I had to train the next morning. And so, uh, like bar owners and things like that would be like, they think they were getting like the old guy and they didn't get that guy. And they were kind of upset a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, I just tell them like, Hey, like I'm not that guy anymore. And then I started having a lot less fun DJing, dealing with all that stuff. And then, so when I started making a little more money from the gym, I just stopped that entirely. And so like, I don't have, you know, like what I would call like a huge social group anymore. I got like still like my core group of people that like outside of the gym and uh, like now it's great, but like coming back, it, it really, it took me a while to adjust like, you know, uh, I would tell people like, no, I'm not going to party or no, I can't, you know, be out till five in the morning, things like that. And they'd be like mad at me almost. <laughs> and like, well, you, and like people, like I would like not come to like people's different functions. Cause I was at a tournament or I was at, you know, I'd have training the next morning or anything like that. And they, they would like, I don't know, start talking shit behind my back about how I was too good for them now or something like that. And I was like, that's not the case at all. I just, you know, I'm doing something worth doing. You know what I mean? Like, uh, now when i go out and i party it's like after the you know the end of like the jiu-jitsu season you know after the end of worlds yeah you know something like that and you know like i'm not doing it every weekend and people that i think that people that do that either a lived a very charmed life or b they're very unhappy in their life and they do that every weekend to kind of like try to fill that hole and that's just not me anymore so people people didn't like that too much but you know they got the fuck over it. <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to do about it? Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, side note, um, DJ Code Red, great DJ name. Oh, I'll, um, tell you how, I'll tell you how I got that name. So I, uh, so I started DJing. My first DJ job was a strip club. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. 18 years old, fresh out of high school. That was my first job. And uh, a nightclub. What were you doing? Place. You were just DJing, right? Yeah, this just was, DJ. Okay. What 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 kind of, let's get to some details. What was the name of this strip club? Uh, it's called The Pony. 
It's the in pony. East Cape Girardeau, Illinois. Every once in a while, every great once in a while, I still make an appearance and I'll DJ for special occasions. Uh, like, like we had a Christmas party not that long ago uh, for our team. And rumor has it we may have ended up over there for about an hour. And I, might have, I might have guest DJed for an hour. And oh, my have, goodness. DJ Code my, Red came out of retirement? Yeah, for, for one hour. <laughs> okay okay and then he went back you you're like nah nah he's he's gone now he's gone yeah he's gone he's gone forever uh but uh but yeah i uh i started djing the strip club and uh so cape Girardeau is next to the mississippi river for people who don't know and missouri bar laws you have to close at 1 30 well illinois has no such laws 24 hours as you know living in granite city oh yeah granite city well technically we don't respect Illinois laws in Granite City anyway, so it wouldn't matter if that was a law. <laughs> but uh, so the strip club was open all night long. So people would come from Cape Girardeau at 1.30 in the morning and go to the strip club because it was the only thing open. And it would get wild. I mean, it was much less a strip club, more like a nightclub with like naked chicks dancing. And so... That was going to be a follow-up question. The pony sounded like it could have went either way with guys or girls. Uh, yeah, it was, was. I was just. I, just, I was, was just girls. waiting for the right time to ask. It was I girls. Didn't. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, but we had a uh, like a college, like a more traditional college nightclub come into the area and open up. And the guy heard me DJ, and the owner heard me DJ. And he goes, "Hey, man, we're looking for a Thursday night DJ. Do you want to come DJ for us?" I said, "Yeah, absolutely." And. Uh, he goes, uh, I was like, I think I was like 19 at this point, 19, 20. He goes, you're underage, so you can't officially drink. But what you sneak in, you sneak in. Um, <laughs> I was like, all right, I can deal with that. <laughs> so I would take Mountain Dew Code Red and I would put it in a Camelback with Everclear. And I would, <laughs> I would DJ like that. And they just started calling me DJ Code Red. And like it stuck for a while. And that's what, that's what I started going as. But then as I got older, I just ditched that and I started going by like my actual name, which didn't have it didn't have as cool of effect as I thought it was going to. But DJ Code Red still. You, you thought it was going to throw people off. People are going to be like, I thought his name was Code Red. You know, no, I, just, Cody. I got like 24, 25 and I was like, man, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who the fuck needs a nickname to DJ? <laughs> and, so, and so I just like, hey, I'm just going to go by Cody Kellison. And uh, the barners are like, what? Huh? <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's how I got the the DJ name DJ Code Red as a 19-year-old doing bad things. All right. <laughs> that's a solid it's a solid it is a solid DJ name. I I feel like when you you know when you came back, you started to compete at Purple. Um, do you feel like there was an adjustment period to uh, that, that do you feel like that? Well, first, do you feel like there was an adjustment period to different competition locally? Um, or do you feel like jujitsu was the same in Florida as it was in Missouri? Uh, it was definitely an adjustment period. So I've been telling people this for as long as people would listen, but I think that the Midwest has the best person to person jujitsu in the world. Um, you can talk about California and their big teams, now Texas and their big teams, or the East Coast and their big teams. But they're all going to be talking about the same six or seven people. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the Midwest, we kind of have that uh, New Jersey wrestling effect to where I feel like the Midwest has like really good wrestling like New Jersey area has, except that the people in New Jersey stayed wrestling. The people in the Midwest went to jiu-jitsu. And that work ethic carried over jujitsu. And you can attest to this. Every gym in the Midwest has really fucking good people at it. Like pound mm -hmm. for pound, white to black. You're going to have hard rolls with almost everybody. And I think people are starting to see that now, especially with like uh, PSF success and their TV show and things like that. But that, that effect is all over the place. Like your gym, uh, Kyle's gym, Nick Sanders' gym, JW's gym, Voggy's gym, Kirk's gym, and even all the way over to like the Springfield gyms and stuff in the Kansas City, like all those, everybody's got just hammers. Those guys are so good. And so I think that when you compete as a lower belt in the Midwest and you win like the Fuji State tournament at Blue Belt, you could probably win Worlds at Blue Belt that year too. Um, hmm. it, it's always like the state tournament has always been like kind of like a barometer for me, how I was going to do that year at purple and Brown. 
Um, so I would always try to do it because guys are just that good. And so when I won uh, the state tournament at Purple, and I felt really good, I, I won against a really good guy. And then I started having more success in the Opens. And I started seeing like the Midwest, man. The Midwest ain't no joke. Like for real, <laughs> like I, uh, <laughs> I, I completely agree with you. I do think, and I think you're right about the, the rest the mentality is different. The chip on the shoulder is pretty big. Um, and people, a lot of guys, a lot of gyms and a lot of teams are trying to prove themselves and say, Hey, yeah. we don't get any love here. Yeah. We get zero coverage up until that Daisy fresh show. Mm-hmm. That was the literally the first one. Yeah. That, that was yeah, that was the first one. And even that was overdue. Like you had Andrew. I mean, they started doing that when Andrew was a brown belt right before he got his black. Andrew was a white, blue, purple beating everybody else that you saw on Flow Grappling and, mm-hmm. just, and killing them. Like none of, none of the matches were close. And he would still never get any love. You know what I mean? And same with you. Like you were doing really good on, on the, um, the, big, the big stage. And you'd have Kyle winning, you know, like Master Worlds and like a bunch of opens. And now Nick Sanders is doing the same thing. Um, you got your Kyle won pans, not master world. He would correct sorry. us on that. He would correct. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry I would have let it go. I was cool with it. But sorry, Kyle. <laughs> um, but still, like that's a big accomplishment. And then like you have uh your really good purple belt, Richie Kelly, that you know no one talks about, but everybody knows about. And it's just I think we have a lot of really good untapped talent here that nobody for sure knows about. And it's just I think it's just ignorance at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, it's funny, <laughs> we keep bringing them up, but the first person to ever make that claim about the Midwest to me was uh, Heath Pedigo. I met him 14, 13 years ago, uh, flying to Pans. He was on our flight, just a guy wearing a jujitsu shirt. We talked for an hour and uh, he's like, I'm telling you, man, these Midwest guys, they're so tough. They're so oh. tough, man. <laughs> and uh, right. yeah, and it's like, I think that that is, I think you also use missing pieces of jujitsu. There's a lot of guys that don't play with that style because yeah. that's just not the game now. But then you get guys that come up in that style and it's really, they're really good at it. And it creates such a problem because nobody else plays that way. Yes. And I think, I think a lot of the, uh, the way people train on like either coast, or like Texas, isn't as mean as how we train. You know what I mean? Like we're like when you train, train with people, it doesn't matter if like if you're like like one of my hardest roles is this guy who just got his blue belt, but he's just fucking rough, man. He just won't accept anything. He'll club you in the face. He'll be mean about it. He'll put elbows in your ribs and things like that. And like if you're not used to that and you fight somebody from the Midwest and they're doing that to you, it sucks. It's yeah. hard to deal with, especially if you're not used to it. And so I think that when people fight somebody from the Midwest and they get that kind of treatment, they're kind of like just eye opened, like what the fuck? And I <laughs> These think, guys I, are jerks. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Heath was absolutely onto something when he told you that 14 years ago and he's never, he's never shut up about it since. And now people are starting to realize, but it also takes all the other Midwest jujitsu leaders to also be vocal about it. And I think maybe then people will start coming out and seeing, you know, what our scene has going on. But maybe not too. The weather fucking sucks here. The crime, is really, <laughs> the crime is really bad. It sucks to visit. There is nothing to do. We got our good food isn't actually that good of food. So like, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> man, I don't know. Our barbecue is good, man. Our barbecue is really good. I will tell you that our barbecue you know? is top notch. Yeah, I, right? but yeah, there's not a lot of things that I would be like, oh yeah, you got to go to St. Louis to get that. Yeah, you know, like toasted ravioli is cool. Yeah, you know, that's whatever. <laughs> that's that's what you got. That's what you yeah. got. Um, but like with the weather and stuff, it's okay, you know, because they say uh, in St. Louis, you know, if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. You might get that's stuck. True. That's absolutely. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, then you would, you don't have to worry about the weather. You know, <laughs> wait five minutes, you'll get shot. It's okay. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I also think that has that helps our jujitsu scene a little bit too because there's nothing else to do. You know there I mean? is nothing else to do. Like like Brian has created a gym that is pretty big for the size of area we're in. And I think a lot of that has to do with like, you know, for one, Brian being a great instructor, he created a friendly community that anybody can come into and feel welcome. But also we have literally nothing to do here. You know, we're an hour, hour and a half South of St. Louis. So there's no sports teams around here. There's no nightlife. We have a casino that sucks. 
So like when you get a hobby, you go all into that hobby. And I think people just did that with jujitsu around here. And it just, you know, you can, you can probably rinse, repeat that same experience for everywhere over the Midwest almost. I think, yeah, I think you're right. We're locked in. You know, people yeah. were, yeah, people didn't like the lockdowns. Like, dude, try winter. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's all it is. It's the same <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, um, okay, let's move to, let's go back. And we talked a lot of past stuff. Let's look back more, more now and into the future for you. What are you kind of, what are, what are your kind of goals? What are you looking to do in jujitsu? Um, or I with like jujitsu? To- uh, more like like more uh, short term, I'd like to win a major tournament at Master One Black Belt. I think a lot of people previously have looked at Master One as kind of like a joke division, but I think you see it this year. You got guys that like Jaime Canuto, the Meow <laughs> Brothers, um, Dom Bell. All these guys are now competing Master One, and Jaime Canuto got submitted by a guy who's been a Master One for a while at Master Worlds this year. Um, Sergio Raimundo, who submitted me at Pans too, dude's in- incredible. You know what I mean? So I think Master One is is a very you know a very very tough division. I don't think it's as talent rich as adult necessarily, but I think the absolute highs, the best guys, are just as good as the other best guys at adult. So I'd like to win a major at Master One, um, Europeans, Pans, Worlds, whatever. All of them would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, the old I'd Grand like- Slam. Yeah, uh, that'd be cool. You know, I don't want to be too greedy, though. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like short term, I'd like to do that. Long term, I'd like to continue, you know, carrying the flag for Midwest Jiu-Jitsu. And we create a good competition culture here where, you know, not just my gym or like JW's gym or Heath's gym, but every every gym, you know, where we're consistently going out as the Midwest and just winning stuff. Everybody, everybody's winning stuff. And I think that's, you know, right on the verge of happening already. So that'd be great. And then other than that, man, just, you know, teaching full time, having a good time. Um, I'd like to retire at 45. So we'll see if I can do that. But other than that, other than that, just keep doing jujitsu all day. That's really it. I, I like it, man. That's a, that's a good plan. How, what is your training schedule like now? What do you, how is your training usually? Uh, so non jujitsu training, I lift, um, five days a week for about an hour every day. It's nothing too crazy. Um, so I lift in the mornings and then I go to our noon class, um, which is our, some of our hardest training sessions for my gym for, I don't know what it is about people come to noon, but they just want to kill everybody there. So those end up being um, really hard training sessions for me. And then at night I kind of take the approach of what was not working for me during noon class and I work on it with like lower belts or guys that don't give me as hard of a time. Um, I train Monday through Sunday. So Saturday I take a little bit time off, like a less hard, like I'll like come in and drill some stuff. And then Sunday I only train one time. And then other than that, I head up to Mount Vernon twice a week. I train with Andrew. I train with those guys and they give me a lot of stuff to work on. So it's pretty much training seven days a week, you know, and then after I compete, I'll take a day to myself and, heel and things like that man that's a good that's a good training schedule do you notice that your body does your body have trouble keeping up with it uh right around wednesday um i start you know feeling it a little a little more so i'll do uh thankfully i have a a lot of people that like own local businesses that support me so there's a there's a cryo place in town where i'll go and i'll get uh um uh, I'll go get cryo after my, my noon session and my noon session around Wednesday might not be as hard as it normally is. Um, and then I take Wednesday night off to spend with my family. So Wednesday is a little bit easier for me. And then Thursday, um, I pick it back up again and then I teach Thursday night as well. So my training isn't hard either. Like, you know, as you teach, like you can't train super hard and teach Mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, and so like those two days, you can, if you don't care. Yeah, you can if you don't care about your students. So you yeah. Shit out of them. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so I teach on Thursday night and train hard, but just because I don't care. <laughs> uh, so Wednesday and Thursday are a little easier. I'm still training, but they're a little easier for me. And so those those two days of like kind of more relaxed help me out uh, recovering a lot of bit. And also, um, I have a chiropractor that also is like a lifelong wrestler and jujitsu guy. Shout out Don Davis. 
Um, and he, uh, he helps me like once a week too. he'll adjust me and like do the back scraping on my back and things like that, that help me out. And so I think good recovery is important. And thanks to people that support me, I have that. So I can kind of do that, you know, seven days a week. Man, that's, that is, uh, that's a schedule. It that sucks. Is, uh, yeah. That's like, seven more days a week than I'm training, man. <laughs> or maybe, maybe six, you know, <laughs> my family isn't too much of a fan of it, but you know, <laughs> I get it. I get it. That's how it is. <laughs> um, honestly, we're, we're really far deep into this podcast. I don't think I've gotten to ask you one question that I planned on besides, uh, how did you start jujitsu? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, at this point, I, so that usually means that's usually a sign that you're going to have to come back on some, at hey, some I, point. I would love to, man. Good. Awesome. good. Um, and so, uh, I always like to, to finish with this question. Um, and it's, it's always, it, you know, used to do something different, but we switched it up now. And so what is some of, or the best jujitsu advice that you have ever gotten? Uh, had to be from my coach, Brian Imholz. Um, he didn't tell this to me specifically, uh, but I was listening and I, I really, really liked it. And he said, uh, whenever, you know, uh, he said, let me redo that. He said, make jujitsu what it, what you want to make it. So what he meant by that was there was a guy who f- felt a lot of pressure to compete and Brian said, you don't have to compete. You know, jujitsu is whatever you make it. And that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu is that it's whatever you want it. You know, you want it to lose weight. It can be there to lose weight. You want it to make friends you can be there to make friends. You want to be a world-class competitor, be a world-class competitor. You know, I think, and he thinks as well, that if you make jujitsu something that you don't like, it takes away from the beauty of it. Or if you force somebody into a style of jujitsu or a way of thinking about jujitsu, that they don't, they don't want, you take that beautiful art away from somebody. And that's what it is. It is an art and art is up open to interpretation from person to person. And so while I'm a competitor, you know, that doesn't mean everybody else has to be competitor or has to look at jujitsu through the lens of a competitor. You can look at it as a self-defense art, as a um, workout, as a social thing, you know, it's just up to you. And I think that's the beauty of it. I don't, I don't like when people force people one way or another, where you have like people that, forced competition on people or the very opposite of that you have associations that only do self-defense you know they don't roll they don't do anything like that and i think when you make that distinction for somebody you take away from what is truly great about jiu-jitsu that is a great answer uh, i really really like that i think that you know i i i that's a worry i always have in my podcast is because i'll focus in on one thing for a period of time and i was like man i hope people don't think that this is it that this is everything, <laughs> you know, uh, I hope they don't, you know, I hope they can step away from the picture uh, enough to, they can see the whole thing. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That is, that's super, super good advice. If somebody liked hearing you and wanted to follow you on anything, uh, how would they do that? Uh, you can find me, uh, on Instagram, pretty much it, um, at judoka Cody, uh, J U D O K A C O T Y. Um, that's where I post essentially everything from my daily life to all my jujitsu stuff. So if you want to follow me, follow me on that. And then, uh, yeah, if you don't want to follow me, don't follow me. You know, I get it. <laughs> and so Cody, I have a confession to make to you. I didn't know this, but I was like, man, Cody never posts anything on Instagram. I should, I should, you know, look at his old Instagram, see if he has anything. I looked it up. I was like, Oh no, he posts a lot. You weren't following yeah, me. Were I you? Follow Cody. <laughs> Oh my gosh, dude. And I didn't want to, I saw, I realized this this morning and I was like, well, I don't want to follow him right in the morning. You know, like, I don't want to be like, oh yeah, morning before I uh, interview you, you <laughs> follow your way, buddy. I was like, I, I got to make it look like, uh, like, oh, I just realized I didn't, I didn't know. I was going to try to tie it into this somehow, get you to get me to look at my phone and be like, Hey, I don't think I follow you. I'm going to do that right now. There you go. Uh, yeah. Well, thank but, you for admitting that. Yeah. But I What's am even now- worse about this. I have sent you DMs before. Have you really? Yeah. On, you're telling me on Instagram you've DM. Yeah, I swear. Oh my gosh! I look right now. Everyone, do it with me. Search Judoka Judoka Cody <laughs> on Instagram right now. Boom! Follow back. Hit him with it. Hit him with it. 
I just got right, now I, you aren't lying. Yeah. All right. Now I unfollowed him. I was just trying to prove a point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to say to to finish or anything like that, Cody? No, man. I just want to say thank you for having me on. This is actually my first podcast ever. Um, so I appreciate that. You. Is incredibly surprising to me, Cody. Uh, yeah. You really, you really, really did not seem like it was your first podcast ever. Yeah, first time ever, man. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, for sure, man. I really love doing it. Hopefully, I'll be uh, your second one if somebody doesn't jump on it before. All right. I hope so, too, man. All right. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, man. And that is the episode. Uh, I had a list of questions for Cody. I got to like one of them. And so uh, I'll definitely have to have him on the podcast again. And I know uh, if you listen this far into the episode that you agree with me that he should be on the podcast again. And so I will make sure to do that. Um, you know, I, I really, I, I honestly didn't know Cody very well uh, before a few months ago. He started coming in uh, and we would get some training together, so got to sit and talk to him. And then I got to uh, teach a seminar alongside of him. We were both uh, helping with a nonprofit called A New Grip, which you guys should definitely check out. And um, we were both teaching these seminars and I really loved the way Cody taught. Um, but more than that, just like talking to him, he's just a very, very nice guy and uh, just a very genuine person too. Uh, and so it was really fun to get to talk to him. And in the middle of our conversation, I go, Cody, we gotta, we gotta do a podcast, man. And all Cody said was, I would love to do that. Uh, I, have a, I have a really unique story. And usually I'll ask people right when they say that, but I was like, no, I want to I wanna be surprised on the podcast. And so I was, um, I was not super prepared when we started talking about mental health and we started talking about suicide. And uh, luckily, luckily, um, Cody was a really good guy. He really just gave some really good information and um, a really good mindset in how to deal with these things, uh, especially because he he really presses seeking help. You know, he's seeking help, finding friends, finding professional help. And uh, uh, that's kind of where I'll leave this episode is uh, just want you guys to know if someone sent you this episode, it is because they care about you. If you were sent this episode from somebody from your gym, they usually listen to this podcast to get better uh, training method and, and be more efficient in their jujitsu training um, or break down jujitsu by the skills. They don't usually, uh, th th that's, this mental health is not usually the primary focus of the podcast. And so if they were listening to this and they thought of you, it is because you were on the forefront of their mind and that is because they care about you. If you have stepped away from jujitsu, whether from COVID, whether from finances, whether from mental health, just know that you can always go back and your friends miss you and they will be so happy to see you again and to beat you down because that's what true friendship is. And that's what I'll leave you guys with. I hope this episode was helpful for you guys. I hope you share this with somebody who matters to you. And most importantly, I hope this episode helps you guys suck a little bit less at jujitsu and the mental side of jujitsu. Uh, you guys have a great rest of your week.